Well, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, wherever in the world you happen to be at this particular time. Welcome to a, a SNEA presentation for cloud storage and big data, a marriage made in the clouds. We've got a great uh, presentation today lined up for you. Um, and um, my name is Chip Maurer. And I'll be your host and moderator for this presentation. We've got a couple of really good uh, presenters with some great credentials, and they've got some really good, uh, interesting topics uh, for you to, for us uh, to uh, consider. So, as I said, uh, my name is Chip Maurer. I'm a senior principal engineer at Dell Technologies. I've been focused uh, in the storage world, so SNEA is a uh, uh, very uh, interesting uh, area for me, interesting organization. And today I have two uh, presenters with us. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Andy Longworth. Uh, Andy, can you say hello? Yeah, sure. Hello. Um, so Andy Longworth, I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise and I'm part of our service organization. And I sit within our worldwide team for AI and analytics. Uh, our platform, data platforms data and AI. Andy, you're a little, uh, you're a little broken up there. Um, you want to uh, give that another try? Sure, sure. So Andy Longworth, um, part of the services team at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I work in our AI um, data and analytics team. So my, my job is taking care of the AI and data services that we have. Much better, thank you. Thank you. You're calling from uh, the UK, Andy. Um, I'm not actually. I'm based in Germany, but from the UK originally. Oh, okay, super. Uh, and also with us today we have uh, Vincent uh, Vincent Chu. Uh, Vincent, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Vincent Chu. I'm an IBM Fellows, and um, I serve as a CTO for storage and software defined infrastructures. I lead. Uh, uh, technology roadmap and strategy for the storage divisions, and I also uh, uh, serve as the uh, vice president for the storage technology development. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, presenting, uh, putting these slides together. Uh, before we get going with the uh, presentation, I want to do a little bit more about uh, who uh, who's uh, giving you this uh, the presentation. Uh, SNEA organization. Uh, SNEA at a glance, if, you've not, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is composed of uh, uh, 180 uh, industry-leading organizations with uh, 2,500 active contributing members who contribute to uh, not just these talks like this uh, about cloud storage, but all over the uh, scope and in, in the world of storage. Um, and um, they reach out to uh, over 50,000 uh, end users uh, and storage pros worldwide. So. Um, there's a lot of people that are uh, in, in plugged into this uh, this organization. Uh, you can learn more at the uh, website you see listed for you here, this media.org uh, technical, and also on Twitter via the hashtag at SNEA. The, uh, so uh, the cloud storage technologies uh, is the specific uh, focus point of SNEA that is going to provide the talks today. Uh, what do they do? Uh, there's a lot of focuses. It's all about uh, disseminating knowledge and information to the IT uh, community. Uh, first of all, it's all about education, uh, not only uh, end users, uh, but also vendors as well on all of the um, uh, topics you see there. Um, the idea is to uh, support and promote uh, all the things uh, that are new and, and exciting in the world today. You can see them listed there in the storage world. Um, a lot of uh, understanding about things that are, uh, you know, maybe not uh, familiar to some people. Um, so, uh, and then also finally, uh, we collaborate uh, with all kinds of uh, SNEA. This is the Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative, uh, collaborating with other industry associations. Uh, and before we get going, a little bit of legal notice here. Uh, this is a presentation, uh, as you know, as you can tell, and and there is copyright information that is involved here. Uh, and we ask that um, uh, people who uh, receive the materials give the uh, adequate uh, acknowledgments as, as listed here in this legal notice. And also note that um, um, there's nothing that's binding or uh, in this presentation that you should uh, take as uh, uh, legal advice. Um, so, um, you know, please uh, 
observe the legal notice here uh, that is uh, implied or given here on, on this particular slide. So let's uh, get started here. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the agenda. Uh, if you've been in the industry, for a while, uh, you know there's been a lot of changes, and we're going to hear a lot about that in the history of, uh, of, of big data. Uh, we're going to hear about what's the current state, uh, what's going on with um, uh, in, across the industry. Uh, there's a lot of things happening, and in with the world of in the world of modern modernization, and with that comes challenges, and we're going to we're going to discuss those uh, and find. And then next, we're going to see what. Uh, how things are evolving, the workloads, uh, and then uh, what's happening to, uh, outside the data center. And then finally, we're gonna look towards the future. So now um, what we're gonna do here, uh, I just wanted to um, uh, remind everybody, uh, there'll be, there's a Q&A uh, question mark in your, dialogue, in your uh, presentation. If you have questions during the interview or during the presentation, uh, just uh, click on the question mark and enter your questions, and we will uh, try to get to those questions during the presentation. It's a one-hour presentation, uh, so we will uh, we will wrap it up at the top of the hour. Any questions that um, don't get answered, we will be posting. Snia will be posting those in a Q and A blog after the uh, presentation today. Um, all questions will be, of course, uh, uh, logged in that in that blog, and. Um, and then finally, most important is at the very end of this presentation, uh, you'll be able to rate this presentation on a scale of one to five. Um, so please uh, spend a few seconds or a few minutes here and just give us a, a, a rating on this presentation, how well it fit your uh, what you expected um, and uh, any, any comments you might have. Um, so uh, I appreciate that and, and that would help us uh, as we move forward with future presentations. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Vincent Chu. Uh, he's going to give us a little bit of history on um, on big data. So Vincent, go ahead. All right, thank you, Chip. Um, so really, big data is uh, I think this this terms, you know, people started using it in late 1990s, and the concept of big data really is is, is not is not new. The people has been uh, over decades, people has been, um, you know, leveraging those various different technologies to do the data analysis to support this, uh, to do the you know, decision support. So you can go back to, you know, even earlier days of 1970s, you know, look at this, this chart on, you know, the relational databases and uh, with the ETL process, with the data mining and data warehouse. Uh, those are very common. At the other time, I think the focus of the industry is on the structured data, if you will. So, you know, I would say that most of the, from a storage perspective, right, it's, uh, you know, mostly a block storage or NFS or positive kind of storage. But I think that uh, over the last two decades, you know, everybody's sort of witnessed the explosion of the data. So, you know, people start looking at that, the, the data contents are, you know, the, the high growth area is an unstructured data. So in the world of big data, people start to apply the same similar technologies in the unstructured data world that, you know, with all this, you know, web-based unstructured contents with all this information and uh, uh, web analysis and social media analysis, things like that. So the predominance of the storage interface, if you will, at that time is uh, HDFS. So, and, you know, Andy later on will have a, a good discussion on, you know, the, the, the HDFS. But I think that I would say that the last decade, if you will, that big data sort of have another new evolution. Still, still focused on the unstructured data. But I think the attention, you know, turning to the mobile and the IoT devices that, you know, we start talking about those are those are the bulk of data, right? And look at this, um, you know, mobile and sensor-based content. Start to looking at uh, the human computer interactions and, you know, the mobile visualization, such and such. And you know, because the diversity and heterogeneous uh, diversity of the data and heterogeneity of the data, now people start looking at in terms of a store from a storage perspective, we start looking at something that true unified storage. Not only you need to have a multiple protocol, you need to be able to share data without you know making you know you know just you know just lots of unnecessary replica. So that's the sort of short history of the what uh, what we see in the big data. Okay. 
All right, and uh, I will turn over to Andy to talk about the current state of the big data. Thanks, Vincent. Yep. So, you know, where are we today? What's what's the current state of of big data, or or not even necessarily big data? Um, just generally, what is the state? So, you know, I would say that today we've got a combination of all the things that Vincent talked about. We've got organizations who are still in those initial big data phases and, and relying on those RDBMSs. And then we've got other people completely the other end of the spectrum who are on the bleeding edge of, of everything that's new. And the thing here is there's no one right answer for all. Um, so people, they're at the varying stages of adoption depending on where their businesses are and what their needs are at the moment. However, if we look at a bit of the difference between the data warehouse and the data lakes, because they're you know, two of the, the key things here, it's really about structure and types of data um, that they're storing that define them, as, as Vincent said. And you know, where we came from, the enterprise data warehouse or EDW, um, and its strength is really in, it's great for storing that structured data and already, that's already been processed, it's been identified for a specific purpose and typically we'll see that organizations are running batch reports against the data warehouse they're using some sort of business intelligence and visualization tools to display with the outcomes either generating reports or, or dashboards one of the major downsides of the the data warehouse is that typically they're pretty expensive especially when you compare with you know the cost of data lake storage and so then came along this explosion of data that Vincent touched on. And you know, to support that, um, we saw the advent of, of the three Vs and you know, building data lakes um, so that people can move towards them and, and start to deal with this. And it, it allowed them to store not just the structured process data, but also the unstructured data that had been you know, exploding here. And when we when we started with these systems, both were typically on premise and they had direct attached storage. Hadoop, for example, was designed you know, from the ground up to work with low cost commodity hardware and spinning disks. And so as time's gone on, we've seen the lines blurred between where these data warehouses and data lakes are hosted. So rather than all being on premise, Pretty much now all of the major cloud providers have some form of cloud variant of the data warehouse or data lake that you can use. And so this ev evolution has been really to you know, move away from that pure commodity hardware in an organization's own data center to really a mix with some organizations in the cloud, some in their own data center. And so we've got not only the mix of delivery models, but it, we've also got the mix of technologies used between you know, the, the data warehouse and, and Hadoop-based data lakes, but also going further on. And so really the key here is to pick the right solution or system based on the workload and the business case that you have. And so there isn't a single right answer where any organization should be today. But some of the key things that are informing those choices the types of data and the types of data processing that need to be done and where we want this platform to live. So if I take a step back to the, you know, the bees that I mentioned already, um, you know, somewhere in that move from the classical data warehouse to the data lakes came the three Vs. And depending on where you look um, on the internet or who, whose information you read, you know, I've seen up to, up to 10 Vs quoted. Today, I'm going to keep it to five um, because of, just in the interest of time, but I think these are also the most important ones. So first off, the, the process of those, those Vs was really to describe the attributes of data and, and the big data systems that they were designed to handle. And again, to differentiate between that structured world that you had within the data warehouse and, and what essentially was data anarchy when we started out with data lakes. And even though we've seen the industry start to evolve and move away from those classical data lakes into, into more modern systems, um, I still think that these Vs from when they were coined are still really relevant today in describing the attributes that we need to deal with, even in the most modern um, data platforms that we have. 
And so they need three Vs, the core of them, um, you know, when they were stated were volume, variety, and, and velocity. And volume was clear. It was describing the volume of data that these big data platforms were designed to handle. And this is still really key in the world today. You know, we know that there is this explosion of data that's been happening and we continue to in produce more and more data. So by nature, the data platforms themselves need to be able to cope with that volume of data. And then next came, you know, the variety. So gone are the days where we were just collecting one type of data from one source system. And now we've got a multitude of different sources providing different types of data from structured to unstructured data. And, you know, the, the, the platforms that we have today need to be able to process all types of those. And it's still hugely relevant today, even given the growth of technologies like IoT, that variety is, is ever expanding. And then velocity was really to describe the speed at which the data was generated, but also the speed at which it needs to be processed. Because this generated, you know, the more gen data we generate from more sources, it stands to reason that the velocity is going to increase but also data has a usable life cycle so you need to be able to process the data within that life cycle to get the most out of it and sometime after these core v's came along then others were added as we, as we went along and and now i see you know as i say the varying size of list but the two that i really wanted to add to the, the list today were veracity you know what is the authenticity of the data and what's its credibility by adding veracity into this, you know, we, we see the evolution of data within the enterprise and even smaller organizations. We're moving towards organizations making business decisions based on data, you know, being data driven. So in addition, we're starting to see AI workloads coming into the business and be more mainstream than the niche. And if we can't attest to the authenticity and accuracy of the data that we're basing every, everything upon, how can you hope to make this good business decisions based on it? You know, as, as an example, consider the importance of the data and its veracity in an autonomous car. You want to be 100% sure about the, the information that you're basing decisions on. So it's massively important to understand the veracity of that data as you start making decisions on it. And it's, it's really a fundamental tenant of that decision making power. The final one was value, you know, actually getting value out of or business value out of this data. And this applies to any system, be it a data warehouse, a data lake, a data pond, you know, regardless of the age. The primary reason for collecting all of this data is to get some form of business value out of it. And so from a business perspective, if an organization isn't getting value out of the data that they're collecting, you could actually consider it to be a hindrance to the business. You know, at the very least, you're paying for storing all of this data without getting anything back from it. But if you look at a, a worse case scenario than that, then you know, the data can become a liability. Think about compliance regulations like GDPR. You know, you're now paying for storing a bunch of data that brings you compliance headaches and compliance risk, and you're getting no business value back in return for it. So for me, that value is, is really key here. The data platform needs to provide value to the business to make it justifiable. If it's not, it's just technology for the sake of technology. So one of the questions that's been asked quite a lot recently, um, you know, over the last months, if not longer, is Hadoop dead? And I think there's a good reason to be asking this question, as there are many things that have changed in the recent past, but are also continuing to change. Three years ago, we had the announcement that Hortonworks and Cloudera be merging to become one company. And so as a consequence of that merge, we've seen or we're seeing a rationalization in the portfolio. And through that rationalization, two of the major products are becoming end of life. So HDP 3.1 in a few months in December, that's going to be end of life. Um, and then in the first quarter of next year, Cloud Air Enterprise 6.2 and 6.3, they're going to follow suit. So that in itself, leaving customers that are on these platforms, a big migration headache. And if they're on, and they're, so if they're on one of those platforms, they're starting to question you know, do we need to continue the investments that we've made in our 
on-prem Hadoop solutions? Or do we look to other things like you know, cloud services that maybe are able to service us differently? So at this point, people, you know, they're looking at the features offered and, and the possible alternatives. And so for that, I pulled a few of the kind of, you know, pros and cons, shall we say, for Hadoop here. Um, you know, Hadoop was designed from the ground up to run on commodity hardware. So it means if you want to run it on premise, you don't necessarily need to be investing in your know, bespoke hardware that is only up for that job. The flip side of it is that Hadoop can be pretty inefficient, not only for small data sets, but also in terms of the way it scales out. So if you have a symmetric cluster by design, you need to scale both your compute and your storage together, even if, for example, you only needed more compute, compute capacity. And so Hadoop's great for batch analytics, but you know it's not so good for the real-time analytics and streaming. Um, there's some workarounds here, but you can't get away from the fact that the strength of Hadoop is in batch. And so you've got projects like Spark on Hadoop that try to answer some of these real-time real -time streaming workloads and problems, um, which is great if you went all in on Hadoop. But if you don't, um, if you didn't, you don't need Hadoop to get the advantages of Spark. You can run Spark without any Hadoop in the background anyway. And because it was designed to run on um, commodity hardware, another thing, another um, part of the original design was its fault tolerance. And so it is a very fault tolerant system. However, on the flip side to that, we now have plenty of cloud providers that are offering alternatives with you know, equal fault tolerance where you don't actually need to worry about running this yourself in your own data center. And, and you know, staying on the cloud topic, the lack of integration with cloud services like S3. You know, we can't deny that S3 is now everywhere and, and not just as a service, but equally as a protocol supported by other, other products. And so is Hadoop dead? Personally, I don't think so. Um, or if it is, as a colleague of mine said, it's gonna be a long, slow death, um, similar to data warehouses. People said that you know, Hadoop would kill those off. It didn't. I think you know, the same can be said of Hadoop now. It's not going away overnight. And for some workloads, it might actually still be the right answer. But what we can say, you know, if, you look at, if you look at what's been going on, Hadoop is certainly seeing a lull in its popularity over the recent past, and, and people are starting to look towards alternatives. So really, the next, the next section of this was, you know, what, what are the modernization challenges, and, and where do we go from here, um, you know, given where we are today? So we see a clear trend to what I would call modern data platforms. You know, unlike the data warehouse, they're able to provide processing of structured and unstructured data, as well as um, all these other kinds of data that you might be starting to collect. Unlike Hadoop-based data lakes, we see them supporting both batch and real-time workloads with you know, heavy processing of stream data. And for many workloads, that modern data platform could be distributed, you know, be, be that supporting a distributed data fabric, but also supporting hybrid delivery models. So with, with components both on premise or in the cloud, designed for that hybrid mix right from the word go. And key in moving forward is going to be the need to continue to support that complexity that we got the Vs that are bringing to the table. You know, there's going to be more data, there's going to be more variety. We still need to be able to support and process all of that. What I don't see is a modern data platform being a single product. It's more a selection of technologies that are brought together um, and need to, you know, that, that support the workload um, that we're running. So that will mean that the data platform going forward is going to look slightly different in implementation to implementation given a particular organization's needs. So to architect that modern data platform, we then we need to start answering some questions. And these functionalities, they're going to guide the choice in technology and start to bring a platform together that can support the business needs that an organization has. Workloads are key here, really. Um, you know, I already mentioned things like the ability to, for, for streaming and real-time analytics. The tools to be able to support those functionalities look really different than batch processing, for example. 
Similarly, the types of analytics that you need to perform. The tool chains to support traditional analytics are going to look really different than those tools that you use to support AI workloads. And the same can be said for the underlying infrastructure even. You know, does your workload need GPU assistance? Are you processing a lot of images? The answer to that question alone can have a significant impact on, for example, your cooling and power requirements on the speed of which you need to be able to feed data, and especially when you're in the model training phase. And the same can be said of the volume of data that you need to store and process. Training of AI models requires a lot of data and it requires it fast. So then you move on to questions like, what are the protocols that we need to support? You know, what, what do the tools that you need to deploy, what do they need to support? We've already seen some people feeling that Hadoop's singular reliance on, on access via H, HDFS has been a limitation. And we see that S3 is almost becoming um, a de facto standard. And so what other protocols do you need to support for, for the workloads that you're looking to run? Another huge question that we need to answer here is, you know, where does your platform run? Um, you know, should it be on premise? Should it be in the cloud? Should it be a mix of both of them? You know, do you have hosting capabilities yourself? What are the what are the what are the kind of questions around hosting that you need to answer? And I see here that there are, you know there are advantages and disadvantages of both running on prem and in the cloud. And once you get to a certain scale, I think you know you need to be able to pivot between the two of them, and and you know leverage both of those. Next, we've got a lot of data considerations. You know, the, these things are going to inform a lot of the choices that you make within the data platform itself. Data has gravity. Um, you know, this has been said for years. And I think this is something that's going to start to have a much bigger impact as we see those data volumes continue to increase. So gone are the days where we can bring all the data back to a central location before we do anything with it the gravity of that data becomes a question. Where is it best to, to process that data? Data sovereignty, you know, this is also a huge theme. It's often combined with compliance, but I think it warrants its own consideration here. Today alone, there are more than 100 countries that have some form of data sovereignty laws in place that people need to comply with. So if you're an organization that only operates in one country that has no sovereignty laws, then you're lucky. But the reality is most organizations will need to pay serious attention to the subject of data sovereignty. Data sovereignty alone will define what data can be moved and where it can be moved to and, and in the order in which it can be processed and stored. And this can have a significant impact, for example, on any cloud services that you might be using. Compliance alone, um, it's another potential minefield. You know, look at what happened when laws like GDPR were brought in, outlining what data can be stored, how it needs to be treated, but also things like the right to be forgotten. Given we're collecting more and more data, a modern data platform really needs to be able to help an orga organization to stay compliant rather than hindering them in that. And security, you know, this is something that's often left to, the, left to the last steps, but it's much harder to retrofit security around a platform than it is to design a secure platform from the word go. And we've all seen the impact that data breaches have on an organization. And it's not just the regulatory cost, but it's also, also things like, you know, things that are harder to quantify, like um, reputational, reputational damage. So another modernization challenge that I wanted to highlight here is, is, is the skills challenge. You know, the, these modern data platforms are bringing multiple technologies together. They need a selection of skills, both from an operational standpoint, but also from support and usage. The ecosystem that we're pulling from here is huge and it's, it's fast changing. So the skills within the organization need to keep pace with that. A really good example of this for me is containerization. You know, it's becoming a key skill in the data space, but until recently, it wasn't typically a skill that was associated with data. Supportability is a huge subject as well. You know, as with Hadoop, a lot of the technologies in modern data platforms have their roots in the open source community. 
a good example technology that we see here, you know, considered in, in the majority of modern data platforms is Kafka. If you want to use that, then you've got multiple choices on how to get support. Option A, you go with a company that gives you commercial support for Kafka. Option B, you go with the open source version from the Apache Foundation, self-support, and you rely on the help of communities and, and the developers within the, your, your own organization, but you save on those commercial fees. Option C, you go with a fully managed service and get somebody else to do the, the support and operations of that for you. And this choice gets repeated over and over again, and it can become quite a daunting task um, to deal with for any organization. And finally, where do we find the skills? You know, do you need to go out and hire a bunch of new people to get the value out of these new technologies that you're implementing? Or are you able to reskill and train existing people that you have within the organization and get them working on the technology and new tools, um, you know, giving bandwidth from what's being retired outside of the organization? So all in all, you know, there are key questions that need to be addressed regarding the skills for any organization that are going to be going through any modernization of the platform. And so, you know, the big question, um, future proofing the investments and making sure that you build for the future. I don't think that we can ever totally future proof our data platforms, you know, the same as any other technology. I think, however, we can aim to give ourselves the best chance here, um, not so much future proofing the data platform, but architecting and building in a way that allows us to have the greatest flexibility and the ability to change in the future with the least disruption. The only constant is change, as they say. And I think this is you know, something that we need to understand and acknowledge in this data space. In fact, the, the rate of change is actually happening faster. If you look how long en um, enterprise data warehouses were adopted for versus Hadoop versus new platforms, that cycle of change is happening faster and faster as we go on. And so a certain amount of technical debt is inevitable and something that, you know, that, that debt is something that we must deal with. However, one thing we shouldn't do is build with what I would say called proprietary technologies that lock us into one particular vendor or one particular service provider. You know, that interoperability is going to be key for the future. And next up is breaking things down to, into a modular architecture and isolating services connecting them via APIs. In that way, it makes it easier for us to change out one module for the next module when the time comes around. Similarly, as you know, we look towards scale out technologies. We know that the amount of data that we're collecting and processing is ever growing. So if we rely on scale up solutions, at some point we're gonna hit a ceiling, a point where we can't scale them up any future. Scale out at least gives us a chance to be able to scale for that future growth that we, we don't even yet know about. And I think the final point that I would make about building for the future and learning from our previous mistakes, technology is the easy bit. These large transformations and modernizations rely on people. And that transformation will have a significant impact and effect on the way people work. And people are fearful of change. So if you don't manage that change that you're going to meet with organizational resistance, and this is where management of change can really be helpful and, and a, a good tool that you can use to work with people. Final question, should I move everything into the cloud? In my opinion, no. Um, but, you know, there are so many variables here. It's, it, it's impossible to give a one size fits all answer. You know, how big is the organization that we're looking at? How big are the workloads? What do the workloads look like? What is their data profile? And um, what compliance rules do you need to follow? What hosting capabilities do you have yourself? I think when we saw cloud services hitting mainstream adoption, many organizations had this big swing towards the cloud. And what I see now is several big companies that are actually swinging back the other way and moving away from cloud for one reason or another. I think for the majority of organizations, the answer is going to be a hybrid model with a mix of both, with some workloads better suited to being on-premise and some workloads suited to being in the cloud. 
the key here is going to be making sure that we architect for being able to select the most appropriate model or the appropriate location for the workload that we have. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Vincent to give his view on some of the modernization challenges. Yeah, thank you, Andy. I think that you have done a great job to uh, describing all the challenges from all aspects of that. And I just want to zero in to follow up what you're just talking about and zero in, in the in the in the data area. Okay, so from from my point of view, there are again this data platform is so important, and you know really there is no one size fits all. But still, there are four <clears throat> key topics that people should should keep in mind in designing your data platforms, right? One is the, the problem with data sprawl. And this is this is not, again, this is not a new problem that, you know, data continue to grow at an exponential, exponential rate. And now the difference is data no longer is spread in just one location, it's spread across multiple uh, uh, locations, on-prems and public clouds. And I do, uh, I do agree with Andy I think you know going forward. I think most likely the industry will settle into a um, the sort of hybrid cloud models, and also because of the the um, the diversity of the data, and you are you know the data will be required for have multiple different assets protocols and with data sharing capabilities. And the key thing is in this ocean of data, right? In this uh, in this in this haystack, how do you find the relevant information? <clears throat> the other thing is that how do you reduce the uh, <coughs> replica of data. In the past, when data volume is relatively small, and uh, the, the the simple way to solve the data sharing problem is to make a replica of data and share it with each other. But you know that that kind of simple um, simple practice is no longer uh, sufficient, and no longer efficient in the in the new world. The second topic is that all the data governs the data gravities. So as Andy talking about earlier, there are lots of challenges on moving the data around. And uh, you know you may not be able to, uh, based on the regulations, you may not be able to share data across the state boundaries or even the country uh, nation boundaries. And um, uh, the the key thing is the data cl classification. And most of the clients that I work with uh, in the past, there there are many, very few of them invest enough on the data classification. So they have no idea what data is in what you know what data is in different categories require a different type of um, uh, different treatments. And um, uh, the third one is uh, the performance, scalability, and durability. And I also echo with what Andy was talking about, right? I mean, you know, the world really needs to have a more sort of scale. Okay, but it, the bottom line is you need to have elasticities in your infrastructures, be able to go through the hyper cloud sort of infrastructure, be able to, you know, burst the data and workload to one place, be able to, the out, Ultimately, you want to be able to run the workload in the most ideal location and get the best result. Okay, and uh, the last one is the data security. And uh, there's now, um, I think that uh, I'm sure that everybody on the call can appreciate this: the data breach and the, uh, uh, the ransomware. This happened. You know, the frequency is increasing. You know, uh, every right now, I feel like every other week we hear somebody got hacked and. Uh, those, so how do you make sure your data is secure? And in the past, the concept of security is sort of like, well, I built a moat, I built a castle with the moat, and everything inside the castle is secure. And uh, and that's no longer true anymore because a in the world of hybrid cloud, everything is 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 is, is, is connected. The second thing is you know not only that uh, you have to prevent the the intrusion from external, you have to make sure that inside your organization, you also have the right management to make sure that the right person, right people can see the right data and can be able to manage the right data. So those are all the challenges. And technology is one thing, of, uh, one thing and uh, I also agree with Andy that the cultural shift is probably the most important thing. How does the entire organization will uh, pay attention and focus on the focus on these data platforms. Once you design a good, secure, agile, open data platforms, they will go a long way uh, in, your, in your next generation of IT infrastructures. Okay, with that, I think that we're gonna talk about, let me give you an example of the evolving workloads. <clears throat> this will give you some a simple example of, of um, the, the IT workload. So this is the typical uh, <clears throat> machine learning 
with data with our edge side. This is sort of, you know, what is what happened today that, um, um, you know, for the edge, the edge appliance, uh, the edge locations, I shouldn't say appliance, that's too, too narrow. The edge locations, usually what we do is the edge location, we're just collecting all the data and ship all the data to the, to the, to the data center, the core data center. And data center crunch all the data and create new models, and then the new model uh, sent to the sent to the the edge location. And edge location will leverage use the new model to do the inferences. So this is sort of very very typical uh, AI models. And but there are a lot of things that make this model uh, no longer no longer workable. Uh, part of that is, you know, in, in the past when the data volume is relatively small or the number of instances on edge location is relatively small, this model works very well, it's very good. But once you're talking about even today with all those autonomous drivings, right, each car can collect, you know, terabytes of data a day and you have thousands of cars running per day, uh, you really cannot, this model uh, doesn't really quite work, you know, because I don't, if, you, if you follow this model, then you're going to spend most of your time and your, your, your costs on just moving the data back and forth. Uh, let's just say moving the data from the edge to, to the core data center. In fact, in this kind of things, you know, the, the network cost itself might be the most expensive part of this operations. So in terms of big data, the world moved forward to this kind of thing called federal learnings. So in the past, the learning is concentrated in core data center. I think these days the, the new concept here is enable every location can do the learning and we federate the learning together we aggregate all the independent learning and create this you know overall learning so this is how this work um basically you know we we learning uh, machine learning model is trained on the course and push the new model to the edge and uh, we request the retrain we basically retrain those uh retrain those the data, we retrain those models in the each location. And we pull all the model back from the edge devices and go back to the core data center. So remember in this picture, we no longer shifting all the data from the edge, edge location to the core data center. Instead we ship the, the, sort of, the, the sort of refined model, if you will. And then we aggregate all those models uh, together and then uh, basically, you know, create the new aggregate model and then push the new model to the edge. And this this cycle go on and on and continue refine your 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 machine learning models. Okay, so what is the you know value of a federal learning? I think that that's number one is improve the model training across the locations. Uh, second one is address the data privacy, locality, and the security. There are, as I say, as Andy mentioned early on, there are lots of uh, regulations that you know basically will not allow you to practice in the old way. There's some data that cannot go across the state line or nation lines. And um, so we will you know, adhere to the regulatory compliance. Also, this really tackle the data volume problems. Okay, you know, it, not just you know, improve the network speeds or the process speed, this you know, pushing the compute closer to, the, closer to where the, the data is. They truly, uh, truly reduce the, the the three addressing the you know data volume problems. Okay, and uh, looking to the future, I think I'm gonna switch this. Okay, so this is still me. So in from my point of view, they are they are the storage or data platform for the new big data area. There are three key challenges that we need to address. Number one is this true hyper cloud data fabric to allow people. Uh, to support the data mobility, I mean, sorry, application mobility. I can run my uh, the application either in location A, location B, location C, in the on-prems or private clouds or public clouds. This is the number one is application mobility. The sum number two is application collaborations. So I have data be able to share by multiple applications that how do I create the data fabric to allow all this application can easily share the data. Remember earlier I'm talking about that today the most uh, you know simplicity simple way to share data is make a replica and ship it over that's i don't think that's 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 going to work the second one is the acceleration technology i think that you know in the world in the world we require the real time decision real time uh real time result that people are you know continue further on this uh 
you know, how do we leverage into this uh, a certain technology? Either it's FPGA based or GPU or DPU or IPU. So all this new processing power come into play to accelerate data processing. The third one, I don't know, TR is something called computational storage. This is really the sort of one step further from what I mentioned earlier on um, pushing the uh, federated, uh, federated learning. Now, can we put the, can we make storage smarter? Can we make storage be able no longer just a repository of data? Can storage take the responsibility to be able to further process the data or filter on data to allow us to be able to be more efficient to use the network and uh, take advantage of the proximity of the compute and, uh, and the storage and data to be able to get a much better, much more efficient result from this new architecture. Okay, with that, I will switch to, I'll hand over to Andy. Thank you, Vincent. Okay, so yeah, my, my view on the future. Um, so I, I see a th few things happening here. Um, you know, data and analytics is a core business function. Um, so, we, you know, we, we've already seen a lot of organizations where the data science function or the data scientist team sits within the business rather than within IT. And this is going to become even more key as businesses become data driven. And if an organization wants to be data driven, then that data and analytics function naturally needs to be a part of the business because they're helping to answer the business questions. However, this really is a fundamental shift and it won't happen overnight. So if I go back to the V's, veracity, you know, the trust in data. So what we now need to engender is trust in the analytics and what they're telling you. And this takes time to build that trust. Um, you know, it, it's not something that happens quickly. You turn it on and it happens overnight. Everybody trusts your predictions. It requires a good deal of evolution. It requires organizational and operational maturity. However, I think it's clear that those that can leverage the data for their business insights are going to be the ones that are able to profit most from it. And that's why I think that data and analytics becoming a core business function over time is inevitable for large organizations. Next up is the, the data and analytics at the edge. Um, you know, we, we already see this, this shift happening. Vincent me mentioned it within the, um, within the federated learning, but you know, as AI functionality gets built into edge devices, be that cameras or our cars, and we, what we'll see is, you know, we, we've got this increasing compute power that's out at the edge within an organization. And that allows us to do more with the data right at the edge. And as we evolve more, I think what we see, um, what we're going to see with the analytics and data processing at the edge is not only get more complex, but actually get further out towards the edge. And what I mean by that is, so for some organizations now, the edge might be defined as a factory where they have a, a micro data center doing some edge processing of, of data from that factory. But as they mature and as, as they get better at dealing with data, then that edge might move to one of the production lines within the factory, having sensors within the production line. And then as they get even more mature, putting the compute power right in the machines that are making their products on the factory floor. And so I see that edge getting further and further away, both as maturity grows, but also as compute power grows. Operationalization of AI. Um, so this is really a common problem that I see with organizations today. You know, getting AI operationalized is great building something in a sandbox, but how do you get the models out to the edge? And as that edge gets further away, that problem becomes exponentially harder. How do you connect to live streams of company data and interpret them? You know, there's always going to be outliers that you didn't see when you were doing something in a sandbox or in the lab. And so these are the problems that people, you know, they're still trying to come to terms with today. And so I think this is where AI ops or ML ops, whatever you want to call it, I think this is going to be something that becomes much more popular over time, helping organizations to operationalize AI. And taking the learnings that we have from things like DevOps and being able to apply them to data pipelines and analytics. And finally, we've got data lake houses. You know, we, we already talked about um, the evolution from data warehouse to data lakes. 
one of those modern data platforms that we see see at the moment is the adoption of data lake houses and this is something that i think that is you know happening right still in the future for many organizations but it's something that you know those forerunners are adopting right now and really the idea behind the data lake house is to take the best features of the data warehouse and the best features of the data lake and combine those together into one platform or to one system. And this means you know you can leverage the cost effective storage, for example, that you see within data lakes, but combine it with the data management aspects that you get from the data warehouse. And I think this change is really born out of the fact that you know organizations realize that one size doesn't fit all. And so the platforms that they have and the data lake houses adapt to the needs that they have within the organization. So with that, I think, Chip, I'm gonna hand it back to you so that we can do some Q&A in the last minutes that we have. Okay, uh, thank you, and, uh, Andy and Vincent. Uh, that was a great discussion. Um, we do have time for uh, questions. And so I also, again ask uh, any uh, audience members who have questions for Vincent and and Andy to uh, put them into the question box at the right side. We do have uh, some questions and we'll answer questions right up till a few minutes before the top of the hour. Um, but if you have to go before we get to the questions, uh, I do ask you again to, uh, before, before you uh, hang up and go to your next uh, Zoom call, to uh, uh, rate the webcast and give us some feedback on this discussion, on this presentation. Uh, and as it says here, uh, the Q&A is going to be posted, and uh, there will be a copy of the slides uh, available, or they, they already are, I think, available on your um, Bright Talk uh, dialogue here. And finally, talk discussion about Twitter. So, uh, Andy, Vincent, um, uh, some, just some questions here. Uh, first of all, do you see uh, uh, the open source community, um, things like um, uh, OpenStack, Swift, um, Spark, and so forth, um, do you see that having a significant impact on, on the current state of big data and the future of big data? Yeah, I would say definitely yes. You know, if you look at the adoption rates of Spark, um, they're massive. You know, it's becoming, a, again, like, like S3 I mentioned, it's, it's almost becoming a de facto tool or framework that people are working with. Similarly around, you know, containerization of, of workloads, um, I see more and more data-driven <laughs> workloads being containerized. And so platforms like OpenStack are, are really at the core of that or OpenShift um, being able to, to bring those container adoption to the data workloads. Yeah, I agree with Andy, but uh, I look at this question in mid perspective call out, I, I totally agree with the Spark front, but uh, in terms of Swift, I do not see uh, a lot of implementation in at least in North America that uh, I think that um, you know even 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 Swift is trying to support the sort of S3 emulations. I think that um, I think that more or less the object storage fronts are more standardized in the S3 protocols. Okay, thank you, uh, Andy. You uh, you use a term that was new to me. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate on the term uh, data anarchy. What does that uh, data anarchy uh, mean to you? Uh, well, um, so data anarchy for me was really when we were seeing that transition between the classical data warehouses and, and organizations getting these first big data clusters. And you know, you weren't just dealing with structured data anymore. You you were suddenly able to ingest all kinds of data, and it was kind of like great let's grab all the data that we can from around the organization or even outside the boundaries of the organization. And then what can we do with this data? And, and so, you know, you found bad practices creeping in, you know, everybody going, gr grabbing data from all over the place within the, within the teams, but making replicas of data. And so if you think about where we are now with, um, with GDPR and, and, you know, the right to know what data, an organization holds around you when you had that situation of data anarchy you had zero hope of being able to with confidence say yes i know exactly where all the data is about this person and what's being done with it because the teams were running off and doing all kinds of things experimentation because they had 
these new toys. Um, so it was kind of, you know, for me, this the, the start of the big data evolution where, you know, people went wild and, you know, just because I can get hold of the data, does that mean I should have it? You know, it was a question that people started to ask, answer afterwards. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. That's like I said, that's a new one. Uh, another question here on, on the, um, on the five V's, uh, one of them is uh, veracity, as, as uh, Andy and, uh, was, was discussing. How does a uh, data platform decision, you know, how you want to uh, lay out your data platform uh, impact uh, veracity? Um, and does that have more to do with concepts like explainable AI? That's a I, term either of you know. Yeah, so so I think, you know, explainable AI, it, it definitely has something to do with explainable AI in the sense of, you know, when you need to explain how a model came to the decision that it made, you need to understand the data that it was trained upon. So you have to trust the data that you're training your models upon to be able to explain what your AI solution is doing. So, you know, if you if you have a lot of inbuilt bias into the into the data set that you use, then clearly you're not going to have a good model and, and really explainable. But I think veracity isn't just um, around the AI models. It, it's around any data that you're using to make decisions upon. You know, what what do I trust that data? Do I know where it came from? Do I know the providence of that data? And, and am I able to say that, yes, it's accurate? So an example is, you know, I, I work with an organization and they were using um, Google Trends information to inform us some of their decision making. Can you trust Google Trends data to run your business against, especially when you don't, for example, have the full breakdown of the data? So really, for me, veracity is about being able to to have have full control of the data and, and be able to say with confidence, I know the source of this data. I know that it's not been manipulated and that it's doing what I need it to do. Yeah, sure. Okay. So I won't comment here. So I, I agree with what Andy is talking about. I think mm -hmm. the fidelity of the data is very important. But I think that you need to have ability, the data platform needs the ability to be able to track the, the histories, the lineage of the data, right? where the data coming from, who uses it, and things like that. So that's that, you know, and make sure the data is, in, is, is, is the right qualities. The second thing is in terms of in, in respect to the, um, the explainable AI, that you need to be able to preserve those data, right? I mean, someday when people ask you that, how did you prove that, you know, you get, how do you develop the models? And it is another problem that, how do you preserve those data? Because those are large amount of data being, being, being trained. How did you preserve those data so you can prove that, you know, it's, 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 it's um, uh, your, 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 your training model is getting from those data. So there is a, another angle of, the long-term data preservation and security element of this explainable AI. Definitely, yeah, yeah. And I think that's something that the automotive industry is grappling with at the moment with, you know, new legislations coming in around ground truth and being able to tr prove what data you trained your autonomous driving model on. Because if, if something catastrophic happens in the future, you need to be able to roll back and say, this is why things happened the way they did. Yeah. And uh, now this is another interesting problem for storage. How do you preserve those data for how long and things like that? That's an, you know, exactly. Those are not small data. Those are big data in the side, in the sense of the volume, right? Yep. Definitely. Terrible. Okay. Story. That's, <laughs> well, well, that's an awesome question to, uh, uh, uh and response to, uh, to end this presentation. Uh, we're at the top of the hour, uh, gentlemen, again, uh, Thanks to uh, uh, Vincent Chu and Andy Longworth uh, for their um, their time today for this uh, this discussion for, uh, on uh, big data and, uh, and and storage around it um, and how it's changed over the years. So, uh, Andy, Vincent, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your time today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Okay, so thanks to everybody uh, for attending and. Um, uh, have a good day.